Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn, and today I'm joined by Siobhan Gates, and we're getting enthusiastic about linguistic variation in the UK. But first, Crash Course Linguistics is out this month, the beginning of the 16-part Introduction to Linguistics through the Crash Course YouTube channel. We'll have a link to their channel in the show notes, and we'll also be doing weekly emails every time a new video is out through the Mutual Intelligibility newsletter. So if you sign up to Mutual Intelligibility, you'll receive a link to every new video as it comes out and some related linguistics resources. Today I'm joined by Siobhan Gates, who is a senior researcher at NatSen Social Research. Siobhan has a background in linguistics as well as sociology and applied social research, and her linguistics research interests include language and ethnicity, sociolinguistics, and critical race theory. Welcome, Siobhan. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for having me. That is absolutely a delight to have you here today. Can you tell us a bit about how you got into linguistics? Sure. So I actually got into linguistics when I was in sixth form, which is the last two years of high school in Mm -hmm. the UK. So I did A-level English language. And as part of that, I did a kind of mini research project. Cool. Yeah, it was really cool. I did some uh, narrative analysis of a couple of um, recordings of my cousin at kind of different developmental stages. Um, He was, I think, something like five and nine and I compared kind of how his narrative structures had developed over over time, essentially. Cool. Had you happened to just record him as a five-year-old because he was cute? Or were you like thinking that you had plans to analyse his language? So neither. So his family just did lots of home videos. And something he liked to do for himself was just stand in front of the camera and record himself telling stories. Oh, how wonderful. So I got him to do another one at the time that was kind of so many years later. So that was the one I asked him to do. Yeah, so it was just a kind of stroke of luck that that data existed, essentially. And uh, I was really interested in child language acquisition. But also, as, as I think a lot of people are, I was also just interested in accents and the different ways that people spoke and kind of understanding why that was and what kind of social things drove that. So then I studied linguistics as an undergrad and then went on to master's and PhD after that. Did you know from studying English language that linguistics was a thing that existed? Was it kind of on your radar and you sort it out or did you get to university and go, ah, here's the thing I wanted to do? So something in the middle. So I knew I really enjoyed like doing that research project, for example, uh, in school. I didn't know what I wanted to study at university so I spoke to my English teacher and she asked me what I enjoyed and I told her the specific bits of our English course that I'd liked and she said oh you should look for a course a university course that includes linguistics so I had that steer from her to look for English language and linguistics undergrads I ended up at the University of Sheffield and really really loved it because there was a lot of flexibility in what we were able to study so I was able to really tailor in terms of what I studied which I really enjoyed So you managed to do a little bit of research in your high school Mm -hmm. subject, which is really cool. Is there for you like a coherent narrative line between that and then going on to your PhD research? Um, Not particularly beyond that that was linguistics. I honestly didn't see that as research Mm -hmm. at the time. I don't think I really fully understood what that was. I only kind of really started to understand that university lecturers do research. I only got that insight because I got a job as an RA for one summer in my kind of penultimate summer. So I think all of that only really kind of came through towards the end of my undergrad and then through my master's. What did you do for your summer research position? I worked on Emma's Isles of Scilly project, which is the Isles of Scilly are a group of islands off the southwest coast of England. Mm -hmm. They're about, I think it's about 30 miles off this, like the very bottom corner um, off the coast of Cornwall. And they're quite isolated because of, of that. And Emma has gone on holiday there for years and she discovered that an archive of video interviews and she, you know, as a linguist had some kind of, you know, thoughts about the local dialect and wanted to 
explore it a bit mm-hmm. more. And when she found this archive, it was like kind of jackpot. I've got all this data. <laughs> so my role was to help kind of just do all the data management for that, essentially. So transcribing and archiving the data. And then because I'd had that involvement with the data at that point, I was then able to write my undergrad dissertation on some of the data. So that was really cool. Amazing. I um I love the theme with your high school work of finding existing recordings and and using them strategically. I think that's a really nice uh, uh a nice thing that a lot of us can learn from using data that's already out there in the world. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I hadn't even kind of picked up on that until you just pointed out actually, but yeah, it <laughs> I mean, especially as an undergrad it took a lot of stress out of the dissertation because I didn't have to do the data collection. I already had it. So yeah, absolutely makes sense to do things like that when we can. And what makes this dialect so distinct? So I think the reason it's interesting is because there's not been a lot of research about it, but the stuff that has been written essentially just kind of lumped it together with Cornwall. Right. But, you know, as we see quite often with island communities, it's a lot more insular than Cornwall. And you get the kind of thing that you see quite often. I think um, Martha's Vineyard is a classic example of somewhere touristy that young people then leave and don't want to kind of go back to. So you get a kind of traditional older people living who work in the tourist industry. And then on the Isles of Scilly, you also get a lot of kind of more wealthy people going there to retire and having holiday homes there and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the thing that I looked at for my undergrad dissertation was the stylistic variation because the video archive had two different uh, interviewers. There was a local person who had done some interviews, but then also somebody who had moved there later in life did some interviews as well. So I looked at the differences with a couple of the speakers in how they interacted with those two different interviewers. But yeah, there are definitely differences from Cornish English, for sure. The kind of vowel space looks slightly different. I can't, honestly, it's so long ago since I looked at that, I can't remember (laughs) the details. But but yeah, there were definitely differences in terms of kind of pronunciation as well as kind of grammatical stuff. Emma's done a lot of work on it since then. And I assume that when people were chatting to the more local interviewer, they tended to be even more strongly local in their pronunciation and their word choices. Did that come through? Yeah, exactly. I remember one of them, it was almost like he was a different person with the local interviewer and he was a lot more talkative and for me, a lot more difficult to understand (laughs) because his accent was pretty broad. They're also rhotic in that part of the country, okay, um, which isn't that typical of the rest of England. So that kind of threw me for a loop to get my head, my ears into listening to that 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 dialect. Yeah. It is something that in terms of the methodology for how people to collect data, deciding who is going to be the person that goes into that space and does that data collection is going to really influence how people speak and the type of data you collect. And you've had to, I know, kind of think about this really critically and come up with some innovative ways in your own later research when you started to collect data as well, how to navigate that. Yeah, I think it's something that as linguists, I think quite often we kind of know that that's there and that's an important thing to consider. But sometimes it's almost like, well, if we acknowledge it, then that's enough. And I don't think we are always as kind of critical of that as we could be or critical in kind of acknowledging how that shapes Mm -hmm. the kind of the findings that we get. So all of this experience led you to then, did you go into a master's or did you go into a PhD program? I went into a master's program. So I did a master's degree um, at North Carolina State University. So that experience was really affirming in terms of that I want to be a linguist and also really eye-opening in terms of different ways of being a linguist um, and like doing more impact related stuff. I hate the word impact. I think it's like a really kind of UK (laughs) higher education buzzword. Definitely. Um, But basically doing more public facing linguistics and doing linguistics that like is for and serves the communities that you're collecting data from. Yeah. So I really enjoyed that experience. It was a two-year master's as well, which I think if you're going to do a master's, you know, one-year master's is such a, that's typical of UK master's. It's a blink and it's over situation. (laughs) It's just not enough. And yeah, because it was two years, I was able to spend the first year like properly getting into more closely kind of into sociolinguistics specifically. And 
then in my second year, I had the time to actually, you know, develop a research project in a way that I think you don't necessarily have the kind of time to do if you do a one year master's. It's all like a big rush in the summer. And, you know, I got into conferencing and doing all that other, I find fun kind of academic related stuff as well, because we had the time to do that. So, um, yeah, so I really, I really enjoyed my time there. And then I went straight from the master's to the PhD. Like at that point, when I did my master's, I was like, I know I want to do a PhD. So, and I ended up at Queen Mary University for that. And did you have an idea when you went into the PhD program what you wanted to work on or how did you come to decide on your area of focus? Yeah, so throughout all of my undergrad research project and my master's research project, what I was really interested in was stylistic variation. So, you know, we all kind of, I think, are aware that even if we're not linguists, we're aware that we'll talk differently to different people or, you know, we have a job interview voice or a telephone voice and all those types of things. Right. Yeah. So I found that stuff really interesting. And I think when I was doing my master's, Sarah Benor's paper on ethno-linguistic repertoires came out and Deviani Sharma had also uh, published some stuff recently about um stylistic variation in the British Asian community in London so it was just like a really kind of for me it it was a really hot topic and something I was really interested in how people were kind of moving forward in terms of using different methodologies and kind of trying to really unpick stylistic variation as it happens kind of on an everyday basis rather than the kind of I think you know the traditional Lobovian approaches to look at you know oh let's have a reading list and kind of compare that to kind of spontaneous interview speech but of course those are quite artificial speech kind of context it's not the same as how we're interacting on a daily basis so I was really interested in the fact that things uh, were moving towards getting into more detail about that and that's what I did my master's project on and I got some self-recorded data and looked at stylistic variation in that so my PhD project, I initially proposed to do the same in London with adolescents. I was also really interested in um, some recent work that had come out about multicultural London English, which is this variety of English in London that's emerged over the last kind of 20 years. Jenny Cheshire and Paul Kurzweil and team had been publishing on that. I think at that point, there'd only been two or three publications. So it was all quite new still. So I was kind of interested in bringing those two things together. So finding out more about multicultural London English, but looking at stylistic variation using kind of more novel methods for doing that in London. I think it's worth flagging for people who aren't familiar with the UK context, just how different London is, but also is perceived to be from the rest of the country. It kind of, this is, you know, mostly my outsider who came and lived there for a couple of years view, but it seems, I mean, London does just have a lot more linguistic and ethnic diversity than Mm -hmm. many other places in the UK. But there's also this kind of uh, idea for many people mentally that, you know, if you're a Londoner, you may not visit other parts of the country very much. It kind of has a mental state a bit like people talk about New York or something. So the linguistic context of what's happening in London is very specific to the ethnic and social and economic dynamics of that particular part of the country. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a, it's a real economic hub, isn't it? London in the UK, like post PhD, that's why I stayed in London, because that's where the jobs are. And, and you know, I'm, things like, I think these figures are not precise, but just kind of as a rough idea, I think something like the percentage of black Britons in the UK is like two or three percent, but then in London it's like 13 percent. So it's really, really quite different. And comparing even with other cities, it's just really unique kind of uh, social context in London compared to the rest of England and the UK. So that the kind of London part of London, multicultural English, I I don't think I've ever really interrogated what the multicultural is doing in that name is it is there an assumption that it's like a particular set of cultural groups who have come together to form this variety or so this is my interpretation Mm -hmm. and I think to really get a proper answer about why it was given that name you'd have to go to the people to Jenny and Paul who you know they decided that's what they wanted to the label they wanted to give And I also think it's important to say, I think they recognise that it's an imperfect label. But I think the idea behind it is was essentially when they were first kind of observing language change in London and doing their data collection, 
I think there was a kind of expectation that there might be some differences between speakers depending on their kind of ethnic or cultural background uh, because London has so much kind of so it's ethnically diverse but it's also you know it's not it's a lot of people moving into London as well as people you know whose parents or grandparents were immigrants there's also a lot of kind of Mm -hmm. ongoing in migration into London of people from all over the place, you know, other other cities in the UK will have, you know, they'll have a lot of immigrants from Poland or that, you know, but London is, people are coming from everywhere. So I think essentially what they found was that language had shifted amongst working class young people in London, mm-hmm. but there weren't significant differences between young people because of their background. It was because of who they were friends with. So, so peer social networks. Right. So the young people with the more ethnically diverse social groups, they were the ones who used the linguistic features of multicultural London English. And that included white British young people in London or adolescents. So I think the intention of that label is to kind of essentially say, you can't predict who is going to speak this way based off of the more traditional kind of social categories that we use in linguistics. Mm -hmm. The young people were predominantly working class and they predominantly lived in inner city London. But in terms of kind of ethnicity or culture or other languages spoken or anything like that, none of that stuff predicted. It was the diversity of their peer group networks. Right. It is worth flagging as well. One thing that I really noticed in the UK is obviously race and ethnicity and cultural background are something that people are very aware of and talk about a lot. But this idea of class and working class is very ingrained in the British mentality as well in a way that Australians are very desperate to believe that we are some kind of egalitarian society. And if you speak to any Australian, they'll say they're middle class, whereas in in Britain, everyone seemed quite okay with like pointing out who was working class and who was middle class and who was posh. And it kind of, you know, you had all these little social markers about where you went on holiday and what supermarket you shopped at were meant to give insights into this structure of class. Mm. I found that really different to how Australians perceive themselves. And I think it also feeds into people's language choices. I think the key thing that's really different about the UK context compared with Australia and also um, America is that people who identify as working class are proud of that. There's no shame about being working class. Mm-hmm. It's not to say some people don't feel ashamed and some people, you know, some people are, you know, they want to be socially upwardly mobile and they want to leave behind their working class roots. But for those people that, you know, are working class and identify as working class, all the kind of cultural things that come with that you know, they're important and they're valuable and they're proud of those things. So I don't see those same kind of dynamics coming out in in other Western English speaking countries. You know, I think you might have that like use in America example, you might have it in a specific city or specific town or within a state, for example, but there's not this kind of more unified across the country sense of being working class or something you can be proud of. And I think you do have that in the UK. So it's definitely different. And so you have to kind of pay attention in this really complex social environment to all of these factors. But as you said, the thing that seems to determine what variety people use is their social network. And of course, you looked at an environment where social networks are maybe the most important place in the world for social networks. You went and looked at people and their language and and their social dynamics in our high school. Yeah, so I love teenagers. I think teenagers are fascinating. I think they're great and interesting (laughs) people. And I think that quite often, because it's such a quick transitional time, I think we often don't Mm -hmm. kind of engage with teenagers enough. And I, yes, I was really keen to go into a school and, you know, it's where they spend so much time. And it's, you know, it's where, you know, they're doing a lot of their kind of identity forming and kind of figuring out who they are. So I thought it would be a really interesting way to kind of get a bit more insight about how all of that works Mm -hmm. for these young people. And so, as I said before, I went into that, I was interested in looking at stylistic variation. So I kind of went into it with the assumption that these young people, because they lived in an inner city area of East London, that their language would reflect what had been found previously by Jenny Cheshire and Paul Kurzweil. However, I came up against two things that was unexpected. One, that getting teenagers to cooperate um, 
that's the wrong phrasing because that's obviously unethical. You're not persuading people, uh, kind of pressuring people into uh, <laughs> doing research, but essentially, you know, ha- presenting to them the value of kind of engaging with the research was definitely challenging. Mm-hmm. So my kind of intended approach to collect data on stylistic variation was not feasible. Um, I wanted to do self-recording. So I was doing interviews with them, but I wanted them to record themselves in lessons when I wasn't present. And I wanted them to record themselves at home, just, you know, having dinner with their family or hanging out with their mates. And basically they just would take the recorders and it would sit under their bed for a month or they would use it and they would do something really, really performative, which is not unuseful data, but, you know, there needs to be other stuff to complement that. So it was just really, it's really difficult. Right, but your genius data collection plans were thwarted by teenagers. Essentially. But, you know, that's the nature of doing research, isn't it? You've just got to roll with it when things come up that you don't expect. So um, I did traditional social linguistic interviews um, and I was also doing ethnographic work alongside that. So I got a load of data anyway. So it just shifted the focus of my, of my work. And then I also... Because of the work that had been done previously, I kind of, um, I didn't anticipate ethnic identity as being something that would be overly salient for these young people. I think Mm -hmm. it's definitely just kind of a problem in general in kind of diverse urban centres across Europe. The way that they're presented is quite often just, you know oh, well, they're just really diverse and ethnicity doesn't matter anymore. It's like almost like that colour blindness in, in looking at race yeah. and all that type of stuff. And I, you know, I bought into that. And then when I went into the school, I was like, well, mm, no, I that's not, no, that's not what's happening here. It is important. It is so absolutely. What was happening for the kids? Well, the girls in particular. So in some respects, there were things that were to be expected. So everything was super gendered. The girls hung out with the girls. The boys hung out with the boys. They had their different areas in the yard outside where they would go at their break times or recess or whatever you call it. You know, they had very typical kind of gendered social practices. The boys would go and play football at break time. The girls would sit on the steps and gossip and do their, you know, all of that stuff was all just like when I was in school. It's not changed. However, there were all of these kind of little nuances to kind of how they presented themselves, which for me, a lot of it was grounded in in kind of asserting their ethnic identity. And part of why I'm able to kind of say that so confidently is because that's what they called themselves, their peer groups, the girl peer groups. There was the black squad, there was the Asian squad, there was the white squad, (laughs) there was, and then there was the Skittle squad because they were all different colours. They rebranded themselves after I'd been there for about a term uh, to the main squad because they wanted to assert themselves as like the popular ones but yeah I mean just the fact that those were the labels and they weren't throwaway labels that's how they referred to each other across peer groups as well right so yeah I mean how can you say that that's not an important part of their identity if that's what they're actually calling themselves and then you know there's the hairstyles and there were differences between the groups in terms of what they did with their hair and how they wore their because they wore school uniforms but there were differences in how they wore their uniforms all that type of stuff was going on so yeah I wasn't I was not expecting that yeah after being told you were expecting everyone to just be one big happy melting pot those group creation strategies were still there yeah so there's this um a kind of the ter- a term uh, homophily ethnic homophily is basically when there are people that are like you you will gravitate towards those people. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, an explanation for kind of why we don't always see that in ethnically diverse communities is because sometimes there just aren't enough other people like you, right? So, you know, you're not going to not have any friends as a teenager, you know, from my own experience, for example, I'm a mixed race black woman. I grew up in the countryside in rural Shropshire. So there's no no one else that looked like me, but I wasn't going to not have friends. So, you know, all my (laughs) friends were white. But if there was someone who looked remotely like me, I definitely gravitated towards them. So I can like personally relate to that feeling. And I think my experience at the school is a really nice example of where this can happen. It does happen because that stuff is important. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where, especially when there is a a feeling that there is so much divide around race or ethnicity, we can kind of forget that like being aware of race is not in itself a racist action Mm. and students in this school are probably doing a better job of navigating a complex cultural environment than a lot of adults seem to manage to do 
Yeah. And I think then the interesting thing for me was how that then related to their language and their linguistic practices. So going back to kind of, you know, what I was interested in in the beginning, multicultural learning English. So that definitely was present. But there were differences, particularly for the girls. The white squad girls sounded, without doing any recordings or analysis, they just sounded very different to their peers. Their their pronunciation was different. They did not have the same vowels that were documented in the MLE literature Mm -hmm. you know and what I heard then played out in my analysis and you know unfortunately I didn't get a huge amount of data from the boys so it's difficult to say kind of for sure but there was definitely descriptive evidence that there were differences for you know the black boys were the more advanced in terms of MLE pronunciation as in they, they sounded the most MLE shall we say, um, than the other boys. So, you know, there were definitely um, ethnic differences going on there. That's not to say it was just about ethnicity, right? There's all this other stuff going on. You know, it's definitely gendered. There's definitely stuff going on also in terms of their uh, school identity, how they orientated towards the school. And, you know, the main squad, for example, they were a mixed ethnicity group. And those girls didn't tend to sound as Emily as, as, say, the black squad. But they were also very kind of pro school they wanted to do well in school so there was differences in terms of that type of stuff it's just it's just super complex yeah that reminds me a little bit of mary buckholt's work in the u.s Mm -hmm. looking at nerd girls and how people who are kind of pro school and very comfortable with school tend to have more standardized uh language and they're kind of moving more towards the kind of using the teachers as their peers almost more than their actual peer groups because they want to set themselves apart. So it's interesting that those dynamics play out in this context as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And even with the boys, there were two boys. They were both really bright, really kind of just characters in, you know, really kind of stood out in their year group. You know, that's, I guess, partly why I ended up being drawn to them and interviewing them. And Addy, this is a pseudonym, of course, um, Addy was very pro-school and he did lots of extracurricular activities and wanted to do really well. And he sounded not very MLE. Um, he sounded definitely London, but not this kind of shift in vowels and, and grammar that we see in MLE. And then uh, John, on the other hand, he was smart and he did do well at school, but he very intentionally kind of, it's almost like he kept that kind of hidden. It wasn't part of his identity to be like good at school. It was part of his identity to be like a cool guy. And, you know, he was really into music <laughs> and he sounded very MLE. So there's definitely all of that interesting stuff going on here as well. I just wish I'd, it would have been really nice to have got some more data from a greater range of kids in the school because I think, yeah, there's just to be able to unpick all of that a little bit more, I think would have been really nice. Was that part of what your ethnographic methods were trying to get at, understanding all of these social dynamics? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all of that stuff I just told you about, the different kind of characteristics of the peer groups and Mm -hmm. and the differences between those two boys, that is purely because I went to school three to five days a week, not necessarily for the entire school day each time, but I would observe at least two lessons and I made an effort to stay there through their kind of, they had their recess break mid-morning and then they had their lunch break. So I would always be there for those periods so that I could go and hang out with them outside when they weren't in the classroom. So they got used to you being around. Yeah. And um, because of the way that the national curriculum is designed, when they're in lessons, it's just like they're on a schedule. They have stuff to get through. There's a lot of content that is being delivered and that they're supposed to be kind of. So actually, the amount of interaction they're doing in the classroom really varied. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite lessons to observe actually was they had a citizenship lesson. So that was a lot more kind of there's a lot more dialogue because that was part of, the you know, but something like English or maths, it's just like content, 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 learn this stuff. So so being outside was really key to be able to kind of have that and then it was interesting to be able to reflect and see how much of what was going on outside was brought into the classroom in terms of their kind of social dynamics and things and you know I even went and like observed after school things netball games theatre stuff I really you know tried to see them in as many kind of contexts as possible to be able to understand their social practices and linguistic practices as as fully as possible. Amazing because language is as you have discovered incredibly complex and messy and tied up in our identity and our Mm. aspirations and our peer groups and it's really great to have been able to go really deep into one little community and see what was happening there 
Yeah, definitely. And I think that's part of what drew me to kind of working with teenagers specifically, because I think, you know, that's when we're most creative, I think, because we're figuring all of that stuff out. So it was really fascinating to see that in action and, you know, be with these kids for a year and see how they changed over that time. And yeah, it was a, a real privilege to be able to have done that. And you finished your PhD around 12 months ago? A bit longer. It's two years since I submitted my thesis. We just have a really delayed graduation in the UK. Ah, uh, yeah. We have the, the same in Australia. Did you uh, share your dissertation with the students and did they have any opinions on it? So I didn't share my dissertation because by the time I finished it, they would have left school. But what I did do was after I finished my field work, I think it was kind of like the next semester, I went back and I did like a presentation and just not like a formal presentation. It was more try to be interactive, but basically just all the stuff that I had observed that they did. I just kind of made mm-hmm. an effort to kind of validate that and say you know here are all these things you do with your language isn't it really cool that all of this stuff has a function and this stuff is part of your identity and it's legitimate it's not wrong or incorrect so yeah that was really important to me to be able to do that for them because I think that's definitely a message that gets given to adolescents repeatedly through schools in the UK is that Mm -hmm. there's a right and a wrong way to speak and I think that's a real shame when that's such an integral part of who you are and your identity. Yeah and you know who you are and what your identity is high school is a very emotional time to be prodded on those things even in the best of circumstances so yeah having someone affirm just how cool MLA is, I'm sure, was really great. And you have had a, uh, do we say a lateral move since finishing your dissertation into uh, still a research career, but a very different pace of research? Yeah. So, I mean, as I said before, the stuff that's kind of really got me fired up about linguistics was doing stuff that's more public facing. And that's, you know, what I really got out of my master's. And I tried to kind of carry that on throughout my PhD. So I was never really 100% sure that academia was for me. Yeah. And through having that kind of at the back of my mind during my PhD, I was able to kind of do research along the way Mm -hmm. about kind of alternatives. So I didn't get to the end and think, oh no, what am I going to do now? I'd like, I put the time in of looking at alternatives and come across social research, which is essentially using a lot of the kind of methodological skills that I developed and learned through my master's and PhD. But instead of using it just for linguistics, I use those skills to kind of unpick more general social questions, social problems, and quite often these are directly related to policy. So yeah, so that's um, what I do at the National Centre for Social Research. And I work on the children and families team specifically. So the thread there is do research in schools still. I do research with children and young people still. Mm -hmm. And while there's not as much scope as I would like to do linguistic stuff, I loved all of that other stuff that I did for my fieldwork. And, you know, the language is is fascinating, but all that other stuff is fascinating too. So being able to kind of find out about people's lives and find out about, you know, how young people feel about a new educational program that they've tried, all that stuff is also really fascinating for me. So it's been a really good alternative career track to go down for sure. And when you say uh, it's research that directly affects policy, you mean government policy around the implementation of different programs and stuff. So there's a really direct line between the research projects that you do and that feeding into things that change government policy or direct government policy. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes it's about kind of evaluating programs and, you know, assessing whether those programs have any impact. Are they doing what they're intended to do? Are they making any change? Sometimes it's just actually finding out about kind of, okay, the government has implemented a new policy. How is that going? How are the people this is supposed to help? How do they actually feel about it? How is it actually affecting their lives? Mm -hmm. Um, So one project I did recently was about shared parental leave. So that was a policy that was implemented in 2014. And it was this idea that in the UK, we used to just have maternity and paternity leave. And um, now you can split it between both parents. So it not only improves things for heterosexual couples, but also gives more options for couples who are adopting and same sex couples, are, you know, just kind of not just the traditional heteronormative approach to parenting. Sounds great. Um, so there's a lot more options. Yes, yeah, sounds great. 
in theory, <laughs> but there's not been as much take up as they had hoped. So our project, we interviewed people who had taken it and who had chosen not to and their employers and different people to find out not just what the individual's experiences were, but also like what kind of workplace barriers might there be to why people have not engaged with this policy as much as it might have been hoped. So that's, you know, that was really fascinating to be able to do that. And it's really, you know, it's really topical. Mm. It's something that while we were doing the research, so like every month, The Guardian was publishing an article about it. So it was something that was, you know, really kind of topical and people are interested in and doing stuff like that is really, really cool. It's great that um, your linguistics PhD gave you heaps of training in kind of general skills for doing this kind of research, but you make it sound now like it was a decision you were okay with to move into working in a kind of non-academic research stream, but did it feel like an easy decision at the time or is it something that was more difficult? I mean, I'll be honest, it didn't feel like a decision. Yeah. It felt like just kind of how things panned out. And, you know, yeah, obviously I'm able to reflect on it and make it sound positive. And, you know, <laughs> I'm definitely very happy where I am now, but it it took a it took a while to get there, Lauren. It took a while. <laughs> Um, I, I felt very, you know, I had a lot of kind of feelings about not getting an academic job. Yeah. I had, you know, I felt like I'd failed because I'd not got a job in academia. I felt resentful because I'd, you know, done everything that I was supposed to do. I'd not just done my PhD. I did like, you know, I did the teaching on top of it. I did, you know, I worked as an RA. I did all this other stuff. I got a publication and then that still wasn't good enough to even get interviews. And I just found that so, so upsetting and so frustrating. But because alongside that, I had done all this, you know, I, I knew this was a possibility yeah. along the way. I just, I think possibly didn't realize quite how much of a possibility that it was that I wouldn't get an yeah. academic job I don't know how well we set people up for that to be honest yeah I think it's one of those things that I knew was a possibility but I honestly thought like wouldn't apply to me yeah I think because you know you got onto a PhD program and you're like succeeding in that you feel like okay well I've survived this far why, why should I not yeah yeah and I think there's a sense of survivor bias from you know, your professors have generally been in academia for a while. That's why they're professors and supervising dissertations. And yeah. it means that training people in linguistics with the expectation they'll go out into industry is definitely not the default way we approach things, even though that's what's going to happen no. for the majority of graduates on a basic numbers yeah. level. So I think as well, like, I mean, it's also changed a lot since that. So I'm just thinking of kind of my mentors you know, Emma Moore, I think, went from her PhD to uh, her job at, or taught, you know, maybe worked at Manchester where she did her PhD for a bit and then went to Sheffield and got her job there. And that's where she is now. Deviani mm -hmm. was my PhD advisor. You know, she went straight from her PhD in Stanford to a full time permanent job at King's and then moved to Queen Mary. So, you know, while they were supportive and endeavoured to help me to be realistic, I think the fact is that's not their experience of the academic job market. So they're not able to give kind of realistic advice. And I should also say that I was very clear in that I did not want to move around. I was like, I've already yeah. done that. I've done my degrees in three different cities in two different countries. I just want to have my feet on the ground for a bit. And I knew that in making that choice, that massively limited my ability to get on the ladder. And I just accepted that, to be honest. But yeah, and I think knowing yourself is more important than chasing a postdoc and then another postdoc. And then maybe I'm actually just talking about myself now. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's really difficult. I mean, I definitely get pangs of like, oh, I miss linguistics. I'll see people tweeting about stuff and I'm like, oh, I wish I could go to that conference or I wish I could find time to write a paper. I really want to have a paper for my dissertation. It'd be really cool to have that out there. But then I'm just like, but I have work-life balance and I have a job that I really like and those things were really important to me and I've got them. So And you didn't even have to leave London, which is a nice addition. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it swings and roundabouts, isn't it? But yeah, it was definitely, it sounds like a straightforward trajectory. And I guess on paper it was, but there was definitely like a lot of kind of emotional turmoil along the way, for sure. Thank you for sharing the kind of linear narrative and then the feelings behind the narrative 
I think it's important to acknowledge that and kind of acknowledge that a lot of people do hope for the best and it doesn't always pan out in terms of academic careers. Yeah. And I should also say that like even in terms of non-academic, alt-academic, whatever you want to call it, you know, I really like my job now. I didn't at first. <laughs> you know, it, it was a real, it was a real, and I, you know, I've talked about it with my line manager at the time and stuff, you know, it was a real transition and it wasn't a transition in terms of my ability to do the job. I was more mm-hmm. than capable of doing the job and I performed well at my job. It was just finding it difficult to be in a space that was so different to what I had been used to. And the things that I enjoy about my job now were also challenging at first in terms of kind of working on project teams and not having the kind of final say in terms of what the research design was or, or, you know, all those types of things. Yeah, very different dynamic. Yeah. And I love working on teams. I, you know, I didn't not like working on teams then, but, you know, I love that now that, you know, you get to share the responsibility, you get to bounce ideas off each other, (laughs) that writing up findings into a report isn't as traumatic as writing in academia a paper or something because especially when you're junior I'm sure it gets easier when you're older but you know sharing that load is actually really fulfilling and and enjoyable but yeah it can definitely Mm -hmm. take time to adjust and of course even though you don't do linguistics research in your day-to-day job you are always a linguist absolutely do you have any go-to linguistics examples or stories or explanations that you find yourself reaching for when people ask about linguistics yeah, I mean, obviously, it depends what they ask. But I'll give an example that I used recently, that quite often the the things that are kind of socially stigmatized in terms of language, there is evidence of kind of similar patterns in other dialects or at a previous time where it wasn't stigmatized. And that just really shows us kind of why it's about who is using mm-hmm. this feature rather than about the feature itself. And the example I used for that, the person I was talking to was asking me about acts instead of ask so metathesis Mm -hmm. swapping those two sounds around at the end which is uh, quite often stigmatized because it will be black speakers who are using it and it's something that's evident in the US and also you hear it in the UK and I said well you know that was the way that people used to say it hundreds of years ago and I think there are examples of it in Shakespeare so you know Shakespeare's revered and black people are generally kind of oppressed so it just really shows you that it's not the language it's the people. Mm -hmm. That's a great one to go to because I yeah I know it does stand out for people as a salient feature. Mm. Yeah it really does. And if you could leave people knowing one thing about linguistics what would it be? Oh I think my pet peeve is when people are described as having an accent Mm -hmm. We all have accents. We all use language in a way that, you know, has a social function. And the reason that some things are stigmatized and others aren't isn't because there are good or bad ways of speaking. It's because we see people as being less than or something to aspire to. And I think recognizing that, I think, is really key in, in shifting the narrative on those types of things. That is a great sentiment to end on. Thank you so much, Siobhan, for chatting with us today about multicultural London English and linguistic variation. Thanks, Lauren. I I really enjoyed being here. It was a great conversation. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. Siobhan can be found on Twitter at ShivGates. Gretchen can be found at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and her book about internet linguistics is called Because Internet. Have you listened to all the Lingthusiasm episodes and you wish there were more? Well, you can get access to 43 bonus episodes right now to listen to at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and other rewards, as well as keeping the show ad-free. Recent bonus topics include pangrams, linguistics for kids, and Lincom on a budget, which includes the origin story of Lingthusiasm. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their lives. 
Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producer is Sarah Dopiarella. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Stay Lingthusiastic!